I swear, those clips are from the documentary. I swear. <laughs> What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video and today by popular demand we are going to review the Game Changers documentary. I'm going to start by saying what I really didn't like about the documentary, then I'm going to move on to what I love about the documentary and after that I'm going to talk a little bit about the critics of the documentary. I'm going to criticize the critics. And I'm a champion. So the first thing that I didn't like about the documentary and something that I think shouldn't be there is the gladiators part. So were the gladiators vegetarian or not? It doesn't really matter. It's not because the gladiators were vegetarian back then that we need to be vegetarian now. It's not because the gladiators ate meat back then that we have to eat now, okay? Because probably they weren't vegetarian by choice, they were vegetarian because that's all they had. The same thing as most people back then. 2000 years ago, people didn't really eat that much meat. 200 years ago, people didn't really eat that much meat. So I know this is a very important part of the story. The gladiator study is why James Wilkes got into the vegan diet. This was his first contact with the vegan diet, but uh, I don't think that they should have gone so deep with it. Maybe they should have mentioned it, but that was it. It doesn't really prove anything and it just opens up the documentary for criticism. The second thing that I don't think should be in a documentary is something that is in a lot of vegan documentaries and I really see a lot of vegans use this argument but please don't use this argument. It's the usual argument of have you seen an ox eating meat? Uh, sorry Patrick, <laughs> I like you but that's not really an argument. Uh, the argument of the gorilla, the elephant, the rhinos None of them eat meat, so you don't need meat to be strong and to be big. And that's true, obviously, we all know that's true, but just because a rhino eats grass, it doesn't mean that humans can do it too, and humans can build the same amount of strength or muscle or something like that proportionally, obviously. I would even go as far as calling this an appeal to nature fallacy. That is a fallacy when you point to something in nature and justify a human behavior by saying that happens in nature. So when meat eaters use this, it's, u it's usually the lions do argument. Lions eat meat, so we need to eat meat. Uh, that's an appeal to nature. And pointing to gorillas, pointing to elephants saying they eat grass and they can build muscle, so can we, is also kind of an appeal to nature fallacy. So I really don't like it when people use it because once again it opens you up to criticism and it's an easy to debunk argument when you have so many great amazing arguments uh, in favor of veganism and you if you use the bad ones well you won't win the argument the third thing that I didn't like that they put in there is the what humans are meant to eat. Are we omnivores? Are we carnivores? Obviously not. Are we herbivores? Yes, we have more biological features of an herbivore. Okay, but that still doesn't really prove anything. What's really important is that we can live only on plants, can be healthy, can sustain athletic performance, can even prevent and reverse some diseases. Uh, so if we can live, we don't have the necessity to eat all of the animal products, then why are we killing all the animals and why are we polluting so much? Okay, this is the argument, the necessity argument. It doesn't really matter if our ancestors ate meat or not. It does not apply to current living standards. Nowadays, you can just go to the supermarket and get whatever you want and you'll be healthy on a plant-based diet. Okay, the other part that I wouldn't put in the documentary is when they compare the antioxidant content of lettuce with salmon. Now, obviously, lettuce has a higher antioxidant content. Plant foods have 64 times more antioxidants than uh, meat. Yes, it's true. It's on a documentary and it's true, obviously, uh, but it doesn't really prove anything because most people, uh, when they eat meat, they are not eating meat for the antioxidant content. When someone eats salmon, if they're thinking about the nutritional value, they may be eating salmon for omega-3s, for example. They may be eating salmon for protein, uh, let's say. Uh, 
no one eats salmon because of antioxidant content. They may eat salmon with veggies to get the antioxidant content from the veggies. So I don't think you should really use that argument, but as we are going to see, later on this video, I think that they did make really good arguments around this one. Next, I really didn't like, and this has nothing to do with nutrition, when James Wilkes was on the ropes and suddenly he went from doing 10 minutes to doing 60 minutes on a plant-based plant diet. There is no diet on this planet, uh, no regular diet on this planet, if you're coming from a regular diet, that will improve your capacity on any exercise by that much, okay? I'm sorry, uh, diet is important, but it doesn't have that much power, okay? Okay, the other thing that I didn't like about the documentary is that they really showed too much junk food, and when you're talking about health, this is a health documentary, I don't think you should show that much junk food, and I I know the goal is to show that you can still be vegan and eat a lot of these things. I know for most people it's going to be easier transitioning with some of this junk food, but because this is a health documentary, I don't think they should have shown that. They should have only shown whole plant food. Okay, and the last thing, this is not something that they put in their documentary, but it's something that I think they should have put, and that is a part about supplements. I really think that they should have talked about supplements on a vegan diet for athletes, and on a vegan diet not uh, not for athletes. I think that's important, and it could have helped inform a lot of people. And I'm a champion. So the first thing that I really, really liked about the documentary is that it finally shows that you can be healthy, you can perform on a plant-based diet, and it kind of ends that myth. And this was the main goal of the documentary, so I think they really did achieve uh, that. Everyone who knows nutrition knows that it's possible to build the same amount of muscle, to have the same performance on a vegan diet compared to a meat-eating diet, uh, but a lot of people still don't know this. So the documentary really ends that myth. It also ends a lot of myths about protein, like showing that all protein first comes from uh, vegetables, uh, all the amino acids are equal, uh, plant proteins are complete proteins with all the amino acids and all of that. I think that's really great. Maybe they should have shown uh, that you might need a little bit higher quantities. Uh, it's not very, very significant, but you, on a plant-based diet you might need a little bit more protein to have the same spike in protein synthesis. Okay, the next thing that I really liked about the documentary is that they finally show how important it is to eat carbs for athletic performance. Most athletes don't get enough carbs, and carbs give you strength and endurance for your workouts. It's not because you eat more steak that you're gonna be stronger or perform better, but it is because you ate more potatoes, uh, you ate more whole wheat pasta or brown rice that you are going to perform better. So eat your carbs, especially if you're an athlete, eat more carbs. Most athletes don't eat enough carbs. Okay, moving on to one of the best parts of the documentary, the burrito plasma part. So on this scene they took three athletes, they gave each one a burrito, one was grass-fed, the other was organic chicken, and the third one was a black bean and avocado burrito. Here I really don't know if the fat content was the same on all the burritos, and I also can't tell, but I think the meat burritos had cheese in them, uh, which is really high in saturated fat, and could have tipped the scales in favor of the beans. So on the next day, the three athletes ate plant-based burritos and then they drew blood and tested and compared the bloods uh, after a meat burrito and after a plant-based burrito and they showed that the meat burrito had a bi really big impact on plasma, on endothelial function and on circulation while the plant-based burrito didn't. So a lot of people got really mad about this part of the documentary and they got mad for different reasons. The first reason that I heard is that, well, if they used salmon in the burritos instead of the meat, the result would have been really, really different because salmon has omega-3s and it can improve blood function. Uh, okay, maybe, uh, maybe if they used salmon the result would have been very, very different, so what? Um, they didn't compare salmon to beans, they compared meat, uh, organic chicken and grass-fed beef to beans and beans 
came out on top. So it's not a comparison be be between every single vegan food and every single meat food. Uh, it's just a comparison between chicken, beef and the beans. So I don't see, really see the point there. A lot of other people said, um, well, if they had used uh, some vegetable oils on the plant-based burrito, the result would have been different because the plant-based blood will be very si would be very similar to the, the meat uh, blood. And yes, okay, that is true. I really think that's true. And as we are going to see uh, next, it is true. Plant-based oils also effect endothelial function. But again, they weren't comparing plant-based oils with meat, they were comparing beans and avocado with meat and probably cheese. And the plant-based burrito came out on top, okay? No one is saying that oils are healthy, no one is saying that all plant-based foods are better than all animal-based foods. Okay, let's look at this 1997 study who split the participants into three groups. One group ate a McMuffin egg and sausage sandwich in the middle of hash brown potatoes with 900 calories, 50 grams of fat, 15 grams of saturated fat, 225 milligrams of cholesterol. Another group had the same exact meal but with a vitamin E and vitamin C supplement. And the other group ate skim milk with orange juice, uh, breakfast cereal also with 900 calories but zero fat. After one hour and for the next six hours they measured endothelial function and here's what they discovered. So as you can see on this graph on the group who ate the fast food breakfast high in fat the arteries closed by about 5% at the end of one hour and by about 15% at the end of four hours. Hours. On the cereal group nothing really happened and on the fast food group with the vitamins uh, you can see a little dip there but it's not really really significant. So what did we learn here? We learned that you should never eat McDonald's. <laughs> but if you do eat McDonald's then eat it with the antidote and the antidote is vegetables and plants. According to this review, there are several factors that impair endothelial function, including increased cholesterol and a high fat meal. Uh, this review has this really, really good graph that, that shows the impact of different foods on circulation and on triglyceride levels. So the more you go to the right, uh, the higher the impact on triglycerides and the farther down you come, the higher the impact on your blood flow. So as you can see, the worst of them all is the fast food breakfast that we just saw. Uh, next, we've got olive oil with bread. Then we have cheesecake. Then we have hamburger and fries. Then we have the fast food breakfast with vitamin C and E. Then we come all the way to breakfast cereal that had no impact on triglycerides but a little impact on circulation. And then we've got salmon. Oh, they actually test the salmon. And what does it say? Did it improve blood function? It really didn't. It, it didn't really hurt, but it also didn't improve. Proof. And at last we've got olive oil, bread and vitamin C and E that really didn't have any impact on circulation but had a big impact on triglycerides. Another study compared the effects of several types of fat, uh, olive oil, rapeseed oil, palm oil, sunflower oil and butter and compared them with the consumption of a low fat meal. The results? All high fat meals significantly increase triglycerides and blood coagulation. Really, look at the average difference in triglycerides with the oils and with the low fat meal and in coagulation factors. It's huge. Another study also wanted to study the effects of a high fat meal and compare it to a low fat meal. They gave one group a meal with 800 calories, 50 grams of fat. Uh, this meal had rice, Korean barbecue, egg, uh, milk, mayo, uh, but it also had 50 grams of vegetables. While the other group ate a meal with the same amount of calories, but they only ate vegetables and rice. The result, the high fat meal uh, circulation got worse while the other got 
better. Several studies have measured the blood viscosity between people on different diets. For example, this one study compared the blood viscosity of flexitarians, people who rarely ate meat, ovolacto vegetarians, vegans, and people on a traditional diet. The results? The vegetarians had overall better circulation and better lipid profiles, but vegans were even better. Another 1995 study split the participants into two groups. Uh, both groups were eating just 800 to 900 calories a day, that's a huge caloric deficit. One group followed a vegetarian diet, while the other ate animal products. At the end of six weeks, the group on the vegetarian diet had uh, increased blood flow, while the other got worse, even in spite of the caloric deficit. All that said, are vegan diets associated with lower cardiovascular disease? And the answer is yes, and pretty much everyone knows this. A cohort study from Harvard published in 2016 involving 130,000 people concluded that by a 10% increase in animal protein, you have an 8% increase of heart disease. These benefits were still there after adjusting for other risk factors. And other populational studies have shown similar benefits. Even in the EPIC Oxford study, a study that is usually used to demonstrate that vegetarians don't really live longer, the consumption of animal fat, saturated fat and cholesterol was associated with a higher incidence of cardiac disease. A 2018 review concluded that vegans have better cardiometabolic profiles and another one from 2016 concluded that vegans have a 25 less percent risk of dying from heart disease, whilst a 2012 one set a value of 29%. So does this mean that a vegan diet is better than the other diets to prevent cardiovascular disease? No, I don't think so. It just shows that those who eat more vegetables, those who eat less meat and less processed foods have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, you don't really have to be vegan. If you eat one egg a week, you probably won't see a big impact if the rest of your diet is really cool. You're not vegan, but you're still reaping the benefits. And the problem with these populational studies is when you compare a vegan population with a heavy meat eating and healthy population, uh, you almost, obviously you're gonna get better results on a vegan group but if you compare an unhealthy vegan group with a healthy omnivore group maybe the differences won't be that big but this is why I really like the epic Oxford study because they actually took very healthy uh, meat eaters and not that healthy vegans and the vegans still showed significant uh, decrease in heart disease and in cancer. So even an unhealthy vegan diet, a slightly unhealthy, um, can be uh, better than a healthy omnivore one. That's really interesting. And on this topic, uh, we also need to mention the Adventist study that analyzed five groups with different meat intakes and the vegan ones had the best results. Uh, we also need to look at the Dean Ornish and Caldwell Esselstyn studies who for the first time reversed heart disease with diet and it was a whole foods plant-based diet. So this is probably the strongest argument, the strongest the strongest scientific argument that you can make for a vegan diet is about heart disease because it really seems to be protective. Okay, moving on, we got the boner scene. <laughs> so on this scene they gave three athletes burritos, a plant-based burrito and a meat burrito and they measured the frequency and intensity of their boners during the night after the meal. And the results were simple. When they ate a plant-based burrito they got uh, more erections and stronger erections. Now this is not really anything new and there's actually a clinical study that is being done right now to test this so it's gonna be really good when it comes out, um, but this is really nothing new. We know that diet really has a huge impact on erectile dysfunction and it's not rocket science. When you have clogged arteries, uh, you have clogged arteries in all your body, including your penis. Because the penis arteries are smaller than the heart arteries, you're gonna get the penis arteries clogged first and then the heart 
arteries. That's why erectile dysfunction is actually a risk factor for heart disease because it shows that you already have one clogged artery. And I know a lot of people are thinking, well, isn't erectile dysfunction something psychological? And yes, it is in a lot of cases, but most of the cases it is not. It's clogged arteries. And when you're eating trans fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, you're gonna clog your arteries. From this study, a, Medi a Mediterranean diet really high in fruits, vegetables, legumes, and low in meat decreases the incidence of erectile dysfunction. Okay, and now probably for my favorite part of the whole movie, uh, it's a very small part when they show the difference in package between a plant-based protein and a meat protein. When you eat plant-based protein, what comes with it? You get protein, but you also get fiber, antioxidants, phytonutrients, vitamins, uh, minerals. You get a lot of good stuff. When you eat meat, what do you get? You get the protein, okay? Um, you get some vitamins, okay? Uh, but what else? It comes with a lot of stuff that are probably not good for you attached. And we are going to look at them now. So when you eat a lot of meat, you're eating big quantities of him. Iron that is associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer and diabetes. You're eating heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatics are carbons that are produced in big quantities when you cook meat at high temperatures. You're also eating a lot of leucine that is the most anabolic amino acid but is also associated with a higher risk of cancer. It's anabolic for the cancer cells as well. You're increasing your IGF-1 levels, a growth factor that is increased the most when you eat a lot of animal protein and is associated with a bigger risk of cancer. In the case of red meat, you're eating NEU5GC, a molecule that is associated with a higher risk of cancer. You're eating trans fat, saturated fat and cholesterol, which cause atherosclerosis and raise the risk of cardiovascular diseases. You may also be eating a higher level of persistent organic pollutants that are toxic. You're eating a lot of advanced glycation and products, which are associated with a higher risk of diabetes, heart disease and degenerative diseases. And you're also eating a lot more carnitine and choline, which can be metabolized in our intestines to trimethylamine oxide, TMAO, which can cause atherosclerosis. <sighs> That's a really big package that comes with animal protein. Now, I know what a lot of people are gonna say. Uh, they're gonna say, well, some of those observations are not really well established. Uh, there's ways we can eat meat and minimize them. And yes, that is true. But here's the way I think. And this is just the way I think. It may not be the way you think. Imagine you have to take, you have to take one of two pills. One, you have a pill that will for sure make you healthier, for sure. Then you have a pill that can make you a little bit healthy in some points, maybe, uh, but may have a lot of negative effects. May have, you don't know if it has, may have. Um, so you get like a 30% chance of getting a disease from this pill. Which pill are you going to choose? I think it's pretty obvious, uh, even if, if we don't know all of the information that we need to know about animal protein, to eat it or not, plant-based protein is still the best option because it is not associated with any diseases, it is associated with less diseases and increased lifespan. And animal protein is increased with more diseases and higher all-cause mortality. So even if you can't explain all the things on the meat side, I think you it's probably still the best choice to go with a plant protein. That's just me. Okay, the next thing that I really liked about the documentary is that they had a lot of non-vegan uh, doctors. Uh, these documentaries, like What the Health, get really criti criticized for having a lot of vegan doctors. Although saying that someone is biased because they're vegan is the, the equivalent of saying that someone is biased because they're an omnivore. Uh, if you're saying that anything a vegan says about nutrition is wrong uh, because is vegan, you can still say that anything an omnivore says about diet is still wrong because he's an omnivore. It doesn't really make any sense. But they had Dr. Vogel uh, from the NFL, they, they had the penis doctor, Aaron Spitz, uh, they had the other uh, baseball doctor who talked about the importance of carbohydrates, and I really think it's important to get all the scientific communication 
community behind this and I think that was really cool to see that even even not being vegan they supported the message of the, the documentary uh, and the last thing that i really liked about the documentary is that it has a really positive twist and like movies like what the health this has a more positive twist when you're watching it uh, you really feel like going to work out you really feel like changing your diet of course all the beautiful people help and all the heavy lifting but i think still think that's a really positive one and i even heard people who really didn't like the documentary say that they did uh, like that about it okay now about the critics of the documentary first of all the most most critics that i've seen didn't really use any science to debunk it and i really have a big problem with that because the documentary shows all the studies it has like 100 scientific articles or something like that and when you make a review on instagram on an instagram post with 10 lines and not one single scientific reference dude what, what are you doing? Uh, seriously. Uh, you may not like the, the studies that they use in a documentary, but at least show me your studies. Show me the studies that contradict these studies. Uh, that's how you make a review. It's not really by saying, oh, that's all bullshit and just... Okay, guys, that's it for the video. Hopefully you enjoyed Let me know what you thought of the documentary down below. Uh, like the video if you like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And I'm going to see you all in the next video. Peace.